One, two, three. One, two, three. What are you One, doing? Two. I'm marching. Because... The calendar told me so. What? What? You know what? Never mind. We can work with that. Get your marching bands ready and be chained to the rhythm, folks, as it's time to march. Welcome to the Music Arcade. Hello, everyone. I'm Galen the Sound Guy Firestone. I'm Wanako. And I'm Eddie, and I'm already tired of marching. I'll just sit down for the rest of the episode, please. Wise. Very wise. I did my share of marching in my youth, and I am done with it. Yeah, so basically this episode uh, theme came on by uh, me wondering, what's a good theme for hmm, March, March? Hey, wait a minute. (laughs) Yeah, I I was joking on Discord that this is one of those episodes where the intro is just a true story. Kinda, yeah. A little bit. Um, I will say, uh, we should describe what a march is in technical terms. And uh, thankfully, the technical terms for uh, to, to explain a march are fairly easy to understand compared to other music styles. Now, yeah. before we go that, I just want to make clear that I have read none of the definitions that uh, are going to be mentioned when it came to making my selection. That will come into play later. I have a plot Excellent. twist at the end of the episode that I think uh, will be fun. Oh, yes, you do. So let's just do a quick, a quick dive, I guess, on what a march is. Sure. Generally speaking, uh, we don't it... usually, yeah, we don't usually like deal in music theory here. But I swear, the elements of music theory uh, that come up here are very easy to understand. Yes, it is a march. It is a, a march. Is a song written in two-two time. That's actually very important. Um, that is designed to get people marching. So I should actually point out that Rana was wrong by counting higher than two. Because you only have two legs, don't you? I mean, there's a jo- dirty joke out there I'm not going to make. I but was thinking yes, it too I as I said that. Yes, legs. no, I... Yeah. Yes, yeah, no, that's, that's fair, yeah. Rana, why do I have uh, fear and hunger in my mind now? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that's probably the best mental image you could have gotten a way out of this. Uh, oh, boy. I, I will note, uh, technically speaking, it doesn't have to be 2-2. It's mostly just a matter of it being a, an even time signature. So that you have an equal amount of steps per bar for each of your legs. So it could be 1-2-1-2 one, two, one, two, or 1-2-3-4-1-2-3-4. One, two, two, whichever way it goes. Uh, I, I've read that there are some modern marches that use a one two time signature so it's exactly one step per bar but uh that's the only odd number uh of a time signature that is used in marches three four that's for waltzes that is correct uh but uh, i'd say that above that the most important characteristic uh, of a march is that it must have a strong and easily identifiable rhythm because mm-hmm. it's meant for a group of people to follow that rhythm. So they exactly. need to be able to identify it. Yep. Yeah. Even if they don't really have a musical ear or musical training, if it goes, you know when to uh, synchronize with the rest of the people marching with you. Indeed. Yeah, you, you don't want a uh, Pink Floyd song to be your marching theme, let's just say that. Yeah. On having, so, having just seen Dune, uh, Dune Chapter 2, not too long ago, I will say it'd be great for sandstepping. Hmm. I will have to watch the movie and get back to you on that. Same. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, there's, um, going back to the characteristics of a march, Technically, there's a third one, but it's sort of uh, a guideline more than a rule. Yeah, yes, that, a uh, pirate march. To do, uh, but it, it basically it basically goes that uh, a, a regular march would have a tempo of 120 BPM, 
while a funeral march would have a tempo of 60 BPM because the average marching uh, rhythm is uh, one step, is uh, 120 steps per minute, so it's a beat per step. But that's, that's a rule that people play, like, they, they sort of toss it aside very often because it's not like everyone marches at exactly the same rhythm every time. No. And if but anything, it, the he... march is designed to coordinate that speed. Exactly. So yes. the whole point is your march should fit your need as opposed to forcing everyone into a box. Exactly. Uh, uh, generally speaking, from the marches I've found, it tends to stay around uh, 100, 110 to 130, but it can go above and below. Th that's not really a rule anymore. It might have been once upon a time. But either way, in, at the end, the, the focus is it has a strong rhythm, it's easy to identify, and it gets a lot of people, usually soldiers, in line. Yes. If you can listen to a, a song and picture a lot of manly, burly men walking in step to that song, that's a march. Which and is yeah, why we started exactly. with Pokemon. Exactly. Yeah, I was about to say, what's more manly than, what was it, Let's Go Eevee? Yep, let's go Pikachu, Pikachu slash the Let's versions. Go Easy. But, uh, yeah. Let's, let's start our, our journey into songs for manly men to uh, march to with Pokemon. Because why not? Is, uh, the full title of the song is Road to Viridian City, colon, Leaving Pallet Town. This is from... Uh, originally from the first generation of games? Yes. But the one we have on the playlist is from the second time they remade those. In, yeah, uh, in fact, it looks like all three remake. of our starters are remixes. Yeah. You're right. I, I didn't realize that, but you're right. Um, but yeah, um, I, 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 this is one I, I chose not just for the joke, which was a fun joke, but also because it is a very traditional march. In it really it is. Constructed. It's it's missing a lot of, like, the snare presence. There isn't as much percussion as you're used to out of it. Yes. But, other than that, it's very identifiable. Yeah, it, uh, instead of percussion, it uses, I think, a tuba for the rhythm. Uh, I might be hearing the, the instrument wrong. Either way, it's a brass instrument. Yeah, I, I uh, mostly just focus on the strings, and there are a lot of strings in this one, and it sounds good. Like, it's a very kind of clean, breezy, open song but still very much rhythmically inclined and very much like, you step yeah. to this. Very much start of an adventure. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, right, uh, right on brand. It feels like a determined kid marching on to their journey under a bright sunny day, which is what Pokemon is at the end of the day. Yeah, it, um, it's definitely got the vibe down. Like, as proof of concept go, I, you know, not much better. This just is. Yeah, and um, one of the things I tend to like about the remixes of that theme is that given that the original uh, Pokemon uh, uh, red, green, and blue uh, and, in a way, yellow versions all were on the Game Boy, obviously the sound for the original was very stripped down, uh, but uh, the versions that came from uh, from it uh, and i'm pretty sure that the anime had a version of that song as well and like even though they had much more to use than what the game boy was capable of mm -hmm. they for the most part kept a very simple version on re reinterpretation of that melody very few instruments and uh, Something that is uncluttered that uh, makes for a fresh start. Yeah, so that, um, uh, that comment about how the uh, the remixes, let's say, or reinterpretations of the the songs kind of remained true to the originals is it, very interesting because uh, I remember a while back uh, I, I'm blanking on which YouTube channel it was, but they basically played a game of. Uh, Let's listen to some songs and guess. Is it Pokemon or is it uh, Beethoven was the, 
the oh, uh, a good old Vista of that. Yeah. Uh, and they were using, of course, orchestral renditions of Pokemon songs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the style is, is very similar sometimes. Like, it, it, those are some easy, um, sort of simple ish soundy compositions, but they are very efficient, I guess. Yeah. They're very, like, very well made. Yeah, exactly. Like, to make a song impressive, the two single best ways to do that is to either add a lot of things that somehow work together, or have exactly as little things as you need. Yeah, there is something to be said for minimalism and uh, conservation of, I guess in this case, conservation of energy. Exactly. Um... Believe it or not, despite all the strings of this, this song does kind of skew towards the latter. It's it's almost hard for me to talk about, just given what it does, it does very well and doesn't try to do anything more than. Yeah. It, uh, the, I would say the, the composers knew what they were going for, and they did it just perfectly. Yeah. Like, there isn't much to say. This is peak song for a kid marching on into their soon-to-be larger-than-life journey. Um, by contrast of a kid marching on a weirdo journey, uh, let's talk about a song in song form that has actually gone quite a journey over the last 20 years. We got some FF7 Rebirth going on in here. That we do. And uh, I haven't played Rebirth yet, but I kind of had to check out that in part because when I think of marches, and in particular military marches in video game, uh, Rufus's welcoming ceremony in uh, Junon is uh, one of the first that comes to mind. I, I almost went for because... that one myself, yeah. Yeah, not only because uh, the theme itself is pretty textbook, mm -hmm. but also because it's a sequence in the game that uh, makes the whole marching thing a part of the gameplay as well. Yeah. So, like, you start with just the music ramping up in the background as you're in the lower part of the city, and when you get in the thick of things, it just becomes important in another way, which is very cute. And so I checked out, uh, for the purposes of researching this episode, the uh, version, because, as we established in an episode a fair while ago, uh, the music for the FF7 remake series uh, good enough, were good enough that it made me identify things about its game w without having played the game. Yes. Um. And so, uh, yeah, I think that uh, the talent at work there still very much applies. Oh, it's, yeah. It's a version with vocals is the main uh, difference. And... Uh, it would have been easy to make it a bit too much, I think, but uh, I uh, I feel like it's just in the background enough that the rhythm of the, of the march remains the center stage, which is uh, uh, important not only to uh, keep it as a march rather than a, an army performance, which are too close, but not quite exactly the same thing. Right. And because there is, uh, from what it looks like in the one bit of tutorial that appears in uh, the uh, preview that corresponds to uh, that music I have in playlist, uh, there's a rhythm game in it, so the rhythm needs to be clear for gameplay reason as well. Yeah, um, I so, actually uh, remember back in the original FF7, this game, this mini game, was a nightmare. I don't think I, I think I got it right maybe twice or three times in my life. It was extremely confusing. It was. I, I think what little I've seen in the tutorial is a positive. As to the song itself, I've got to say, there, turning it into a 
almost Soviet sounding anthem while representing a deeply capitalist corporatocracy is a power play. Yeah, it's like, I wouldn't say it goes full Soviet and famine. No. We'll get back to that, of course. We shall. But, but uh, it definitely has this very inflamed patriotism vibe. Yeah. Uh, that feels uh, artificial, which fits the theme perfectly. As oh, 100%. I'm concerned. Um, yeah, I, I was going to say, like, I, I don't fully get the Soviet aspect, but I do definitely get the anthem vibes. Uh, this, like, if not for those la la la's that happen on occasion on the vocals, this could pass for a national anthem. Uh, those la la la's are a big part of what makes this feel very artificial. Uh, I feel a, like an it's not quite national anthem like because it's almost too sycophantic for that. Like, I haven't looked up if the vocals actually have lyrics or if it's just vocalizations uh, so I don't know what it says or, or in what language for that matter but I can almost feel by the tone and the music surrounding it that it's all like uh, uh, with the new president we're looking at a bright of you two let's all march together blah 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 kind of tone um. it's in a way, the vocals being kind of weak compared to the rhythm also help set up this, like, tone of projected strength more than anything else. The projection being the part that matters. Yes. Um, I also love, in a strictly meta sense, just... This song fully takes advantage of a door that was kicked open by the original FF7 by incorporating these vocals. I find that kind of delicious. Oh, yeah. Like, it fits very well. It oh, yeah. feels like a natural follow-up. It absolutely does. Um, I remember our very first episode uh, complaining that FF7 Remake was named Best Soundtrack of the Year at the Game Awards because it was such a close remix. Um, I still stand by that. This is just 1997 music, but better. Yeah. But it also just goes to show how timeless that soundtrack is. Exactly. Although, if we're going to talk about timelessness, I see no better example of a timeless game than Chrono Trigger, personally. And not uh, just because it has actual time travel in it. Yeah, no, that one's definitely an all-time classic, even aside the obvious in-joke of, of time travel. And hey, look, it's a yeah. JRPG that Eddie's actually played and enjoyed. Check that out. Miracles happen, I guess. Um, when I selected this song, it was before the recent passing of Akira Toriyama, so I feel I should kind of bring uh, that up. Yeah, of course. Uh, briefly, the song in question being... Uh, Pride and Glory in Guardia Castle. Yes. Uh, symphonic uh, uh, orchestra. Now, yeah, like, like you said, uh, now that it has been cleared up, uh, yeah, this was uh, an accidentally uh, relevant selection and uh, one that uh, serves as a reminder of uh, the incredible impact uh, this uh, uh, this man had on uh, on anime, manga, video games. Uh. Yeah, like uh, I think for full transparency, it's worth noting. Uh, he actually passed away about a week uh, prior to this recording, but the news came out about like four days ago. Yes, so yes. We're it's very fresh in our minds yeah. right now. Uh. I don't want to get into him too much on a personal level. Um, he didn't have much to do with Chrono Trigger other than the art and character designs. Uh, it's not like he wrote the story. He especially didn't write the music. Yeah, exactly. Um, this but, was my uh, first choice of a song, if, however. If like, you were going to use uh, timelessness as a way to, to transition to that, 
Timeless is definitely something that uh, fits him and his style to the point where like one of the key things I thought uh, when I thought of Toriyama is how little his art style changed over, y over the years. I um, that is accurate. So the song is Guardian Castle. This was my first choice right out of the gate. It was either this or Judon, and I picked this one and you picked Judon. So, you know, <laughs> again, that just kind of goes to show how I don't want to say, like how obvious these two selections really are. Yeah. Um, and I went with the Blake Robinson version because I love Blake Robinson. And uh, there's another song. Good reason. Yeah, he's really good. Um, Blake Robinson is the composer of Portal Knights and the Stanley Parable. He's also done a lot of remix albums for Chrono Trigger for Super Metroid. I think he did a Kirby album at one point. Um, he's a super good dude. I love this guy's work to death. Um, so I, uh, this, this, his version of this song in particular has always just stuck in my mind because of just how bombastic and powerful it is. Yeah, it, like we were talking with the previous song about uh, things that are a bit more toned down to let some elements shine through. This one, given that it doesn't have vocals, it just all energy all the time. Yeah. Yeah, this Which, is, for what is essentially like, a strictly classical com uh, composition, is very impressive. Yeah, th and and this this song really, re really proves why it has the title of Pride and Glory, because that's exactly the vibe it gives off. Yeah. Uh, notably, it only plays when Guardia Castle is not in some kind of problem land. Um, in in incidentally, uh, I actually used a a manual. Uh, tempo counter to just compare the different tempos of our songs and see which ones trade the most from from the quote unquote definition of a march that we gave at the top of the episode. This one is one of only two songs in this episode that are exactly 120 BPM. Hmm. You you can't get more of a traditional march than that. Yeah, and that's again why it was my proof of concept. Like. You want to talk about a march in video games? It, I, I, there's really the two main choices. This one and Judon, and we just covered both of them. Yeah. And I think they contrast each other really well because of the perception of the factions they aim to represent. Yeah. With uh, the Shinra company being uh, very, uh, having this need to project strength and to uh, show their big voice and the likes, and this one feeling like a more organic proud faction. Yeah, it, it feels more celebratory. Yes. Um, also, can I give a shout-out to Blake Robinson's horn samples? This is one of the only, like, this this mix is like 10 years old, and I don't know if he has, like, the big East-West sample pack. These horns sound really good. He knows how to massage his samples to make them sound really good. Horn samples are usually very easy to get wrong. Ah. Yeah, he's not only is he uh, an amazing arranger, but his uh, his samples are some of the best I've heard for orchestral yeah. samples. He also has really great vocal it. samples that he uses a little bit on this song, more so on his other tracks. But uh, it's just another thing that he's very good at that aren't really uh, examined as. Uh, often as they should be, I think. Um, and hey, since you have the expertise to do that sort of thing, yeah, it's always great to bring it forward. Absolutely, make use of it. Uh, you know, if you're good at something, don't hide it behind. Don't hide it from the world. Exactly. Um. So yeah. Uh, again, this was just. This is a proof of concept. It's a hard beat. It's a lot of, a lot of horns. I'm not, again, I'm just kind of rambling at this point. It says a lot that I'm talking more about the composer than I am the composition. Yeah, because what else is there to say about the composition much further than it's a march, march, march? Yeah. Yeah, it's like, you, it you gave me a concept, I did the concept. Next! 
Yeah. The the next one is kind of a repeat of that, just with more metal, let's be honest. Mm, I disagree on that. Oh yeah, no. Just like, how, just... how much is iconic, yes, but it is not a traditional march, let alone song in any way. It's weird. What's... It's good weird, too. It's good and weird. Yes, What's it's... funny is the song it most reminds me of is a Rammstein song, which is also about a march, just in that case... Um, poking at and largely uh, yelling about Nazi marches, because they're Rammstein. Yeah. Um, well, to be clear, I feel like uh, this song's uh, vocal sample invoke it, but don't go over the line, because all the vocal sample says is Die Waffen zit an, which means weapons at the ready. Which makes sense for a war game, like, yeah. Exactly. And not only a war game, a war game whose entire premise is that somebody went back in time and killed Hitler. Yes. So, the Germans never went the way of National Socialism and everything that happened, so World War II ends up bet between the Allies, which includes Germany, and the Soviets. Exactly. Um, also, a whole lot of ham and cheese on the part of the actors involved in, uh, in this franchise. To its credit. Delicious, delicious ham and cheese. Oh yeah, no, it's wonderful how just like deliberately over the top all of these performances are. I I think if you're going to bear some some uh, FMV sequences in other video game, they might as well be as over the top as they were in those games. Absolutely. Looking at human who was his name. <sighs> I didn't uh, think of that, damn you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Hellmarch. Uh, it's pretty fast for March. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, I know that sounds... not because I counted that, but because I went by its pace uh, when I heard it on a playlist uh, a couple of times and uh, ended up winded by the time it ended. <laughs> See, the funny thing is, it sounds fast, but it's the only other song in our playlist that goes exactly 120. Oh, really? <laughs> well, the, because it's the beats of the song are actually synced to the March sample in the intro, and the March sample follows what oh, we said about 120. Of course, it would. So it actually is exactly 120 BPM. It is. Amazing. Okay. Um, yeah, this... Guess I'm just easily, easily winded then. Uh, alternately, and this is something that's going to come up later, um, you mm -hmm. may have been counting on the eighth notes instead of the quarters, or or the halves, depending on how this is notated. Yeah, hmm. You may might have been doing 240. That would be the end I result, I doubt yes. it. I severely doubt it. Uh, no, back to the music. Uh, so, it's got, of course, uh, for uh, uh, Frank Trepaki's song, especially at this time, some amazing guitar. Oh, yeah. That goes hard and heavy. Well, I specifically noted down that the marching calls and the guitar live rent-free in my brain ever since I first listened to this. Yeah, and, like... The march may be the pace, but the guitar is the star. Mm hmm Which gives you kind of an outside look at this march. You're not, you're not the foot soldier. You're seeing it from above, which is fitting given that this is an RTS game. Maybe I'm reading a little bit too much into it, but that seems cool, so... Hey, might as well put it out there. Your media analysis are part of the reason we are here, so... Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it goes really hard for, like, three minutes of uh, uh, guitar sickness with that march, and then it transitions to uh, a more techno beat. Which is on brand for Klopaki, and the very yeah. sci-fi energy that the song and the game have. 
Yeah, exactly. It's just that it feels like a song of two halves, you know? One which entered in legend and the other which... helps... wind it down a little bit. Because, like, it's still on that uninterrupted pace, but, uh... Like, when you think of Hellmarch, you think of the da na 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 and not the... Uh, the... Uh, the seams uh, and the like at the end. Right. Uh, but, uh... Very, 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 very much there. And, and it works, like, everything works together, not just with the theme of the the game, but also, uh, as a song, even though you do have distinct parts, you can listen to it straight up and not have a single issue. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and yeah, like, this song uh, has, uh, also has that uh, timeless na nature to it, in part uh, celebrated by the fact that there are as many Hell Marches as there are Red Alert games. They had a sequel for Red Alert 2, they had a Hell March 3 for Red Alert 3, but the song I want to talk about next, well it is from Red Alert 3, is not Hell March 3, which felt very close to Hell March 2 for that matter. Uh, but I feel like Soviet March broke some more interesting ground to me by not trying to do another Hell March. Yeah. And instead, leaning into uh, very much the the imagery and the kind of pop culture aspect of uh, the imagery it represents, like these uh, these uh, Soviet-inspired tunes uh, feel big, and uh, they are kind of they have very a ton of energy going forward. Yeah. And they seem to revel in the excess they carry to the point that uh, this really conveys the idea that this isn't... Uh, this faction isn't the USSR that realistically could have uh, been at uh, this time or a few years in the future, the USSR that we knew of. This is the USSR of all the action and spy movies expanded and given its own form. Yeah. This is pop culture USSR, and it works great for that. It absolutely does. I mean, again, it's hard to bring up... Um, it, it's hard to bring up Red Alert 3 without just how, op like, how just iconic Tim Curry's performance was. Absolutely. And he did that in part by being super campy and over the top in a perfect way. Yeah. Um, and that worked really well. Yeah. I have a ton of love for this game. Understandably. Um, I'm the... good at it, but I love it. <laughs> that That's a mood. Oh yeah, for <laughs> sure. We, we'll talk a, a bit more about the mood of Liking a game, being off with it during now playing, uh, I assure you. Hey, I didn't say awful. Uh, I am. <laughs> I am. But uh, yeah, th this song, like, uh, at the same time, I can't listen to this and not picture Soviet soldiers marching, but it is also very cartoonish. In yeah, that, yes. In how it is. It's like, I don't picture this playing, actually playing as soldiers soviet soldiers are marching but i picture this in like a, a propaganda piece from another country during the cold war showing exactly. those soldiers marching exactly i actually this is kind of seen through to... a lens sorry say again no no uh this is uh to me yeah that uh red menace seen through an outside lens yeah um I, again, I think Rana kind of hit the nail on the head when he said earlier it was very much a, uh, like a spy movie version. So not even propaganda to me, but them as an actual, like, malevolent force in the cheesiest and actioniest sort of way. 
Yeah, like we are talking about a game where one of the early game anti-infantry strategies is to take your amphibious APC and uh, use it to launch in the air uh, armored mind-controlled bears that uh, parachute down to eat the enemy infantry. Yeah, it's wonderful. I do that every Friday. I don't know what's so weird about it. You have control of a magnet aimed to create space trash that you can then order to fall on your enemies. Yeah, this is that's, the sort of... That's, that's on Saturday. <laughs> yeah, that's the sort of game this is, and I think it captures that vibe really perfectly. Yeah. It does say a lot that I'm now stuck with the image of, uh, of Tim Curry going... Uh, talking about how he's going to the only place free of capitalism, space. Space! Legendary light. Best part is how he, he can't hold the laughter. Yeah. But, uh, the, the, Sh the music shame is... they went, uh, they then uh, went uh, and used uh, those uh, strategy franchises to uh, chase after trends that never materialized. Oof. But, uh, uh, yeah, I would say, like, th this song, it, it's just as, as good as the, the, the actors I in the game. It, it, yeah. As a whole, this is a great product, Red Alert 3. Yeah, exactly. And it may not have had a sequel, but there was an Expand Alone, which had another version of that song, which... Uh, was used as a main menu theme as well, but instead of the song playing as it is, it's like a a version like you'd hear on an old gramophone with just a female soloist uh, going for the lyrics uh, as uh, the as a very uh, low key piano version uh, of the melody uh, rings in the background. It's it felt. A few years before, like, uh, to give you an idea, Galen, kind of like uh, hearing the FF14's Imperial March uh, for three expansions in a row, and then hearing the uh, version on the Galleon radio station. Aha! Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. That is so a cool effect times. if done right, so I'm all about it. Yeah, exactly. Oh, speaking of things that are cool if done right and very dull if done wrong, <laughs> let's talk about Bravely Default. Yeah, from the world's uh, most consistently okay sub-developer at Square. I'm increasingly... They are, they are the game's logo, aren't they? They really are. Um, I'm increasingly convinced that this dev team just had lightning in a bottle with Bravely Default 1 and... Yes. Nothing that's come since from this team has been awful, but none of it has been really good either, and obviously exactly. my problems with my problems with uh Octopath Traveler's story uh are so infamous now that uh I got hired in a voice acting role because the script referenced that exact rant. <laughs> um as for Bravely Default, one thing I don't think anyone could say is bad is the soundtrack. Correct. Uh, and this song, the uh, the Duke uh, under the Duke's flag, uh, where the story starts to turn on its head, and you realize that things aren't as clean as they could be, um, are the uh, is the anthem of the principal bad guys in extreme quotation marks. But they are also bad guys. But they're not. But they are. But they're not. But they are. But timelines. Um, timelines. It's it's a good song. Yeah. It has a very different vibe from the other ones because it's like it's trying to be a bad guy song but written in the language of a good gay military march or something. Yeah. I mean it's it's maybe basically... it's a matter of key, maybe it's a matter of it's something else, I don't know. You could honestly describe it as a corruption of my first track, Power and Glory, um, because it does sound like well-meaning, but also your enemy. 
Yeah. Um, I picked this one again, mostly as a very direct example of what you could expect from this genre. Um, so this one, uh, I don't really have all that much to say about it because it hits almost all the same hallmarks as Power, or, uh, not Power and Glory. Power and Glory right is from Dynasty Warriors. Thank you, Pride and Glory. Um, it hits almost the same hallmarks. It's the same, like, hard beat, the classical instrumentation, the heavy use of horns. I, I might have been the one who listened to this with zero context, because I've never touched a Bravely Default game. Um, but the, the vibe I got, I won't say it was necessarily evil march, but there is a more chaotic energy to it. Like, the other songs we've talked thus far are clearly, you are marching, uh, either alone in the case of Pokemon or a part of an army in the case of the other songs. This feels... It feels more like trying to march when you already are in the middle of a battlefield. Interesting. Yeah, the the way I'm getting, um, tell me if you can picture us as well, is more like there is a march going outside of people that really want your head and you're hiding in a building uh, right uh, next to that march. Like, this doesn't feel like a song that's for you, but that's that one that's for somebody that really wants your head on a platter. Yeah, I, I like the way I, you put that. I, I, I suppose I can see that. It's not quite my interpretation, but I, I, I can definitely see of course. that. Uh, I mean, excellent. honestly, having uh, varied interpretations is great. It's something that we should be striving yes. towards. Yeah, Indeed. that will come up later. Uh, <laughs> yeah, honestly, the, a, a couple of things jumped to me on this song uh, that make it sound not quite traditional march like to me. Uh, one of them is the kind of subtle use of bells throughout the entire song. Mm -hmm. uh, they add some very interesting texture in the background. And the other thing is the main image that came to my mind as far as like gameplay is concerned, as someone who hasn't played Bravely Default, is actually Final Fantasy Tactics. Because you have those in battle, the character figures, they are all uh, walking without like, the, the animation is of them walking, but they are oh. staying, they stand still, and their walking animation usually sinks at the start of battle, but you are in the middle of the battle still, so, mm, yeah. I see, I see. Yeah, it's got a bit of that, of that tactics energy. Yeah, so yeah those, okay. Th th those, are, those are some things that came to my mind and sort of uh, separated it, let, let's say, from the other marches. It's a, Interesting. It, it's a very neat song. It sounds really cool. Yeah. Yeah, um, Revo. Revo? Revo? I'm not sure how to pronounce this guy's stage name. Really cool composer. Did some great work on this one. Great work on Bravely Default 2. Someone else did Bravely Second, which is not Bravely Default 2. I have not heard the Bravely Second soundtrack, so I can't really comment on it to any great degree. Who cares about consistent sequel titles, right? <sighs> Honestly, for this game, they kind of get a pass, but not anymore, but they did. They used to. Look, they... This series invokes feelings. That's a good way to put it. It sounds like it. <laughs> I still need to play Bravely Second at some point. Like, even if I end up putting it down and not enjoying it, I need to at least try it. I will note I'm not sure I want to have those feelings that you guys have, but it sure sounds like there are some strong feelings that, that uh, that's not something I can dispute. Yeah. Or maybe some not strong enough feelings at times. At least that's how I felt for Bravely Second. Still on my 3DS, but haven't finished it. Now then, for something that's uh, a little bit of a darker, more sinister mood. Uh, Eddie, take us down to the depth of Norfair. Norfair from Super Metroid, specifically the Ridley's Lair theme for Norfair. Yeah, lower Norfair. Um... 
As usual, yeah. shout out to Blake Robinson's remix of this song as well. Which is excellent. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it's a shame Nintendo Nintendo'd him. Oh. <sighs> there will be conversations about Nintendo Nintendoing things at some point, just not this episode, I think. Yeah. Let's talk about the good things Nintendo does on occasion. Uh, this this is a song that actually gives me the vibe that Rana was trying to describe with the previous song of like an enemy being around you. Mm, uh, fair, fair. To me, this this song is either you are marching towards danger and you know it, or the danger is marching towards you. Yeah, it's got that very resolute feeling to it. And so, in a way, it also captures a feeling of a march, but with a m less populous kind of uh, situation. Like, there aren't a ton of people around. Yeah, it sounds kind of... As far as the SNES could do it, it sounds a bit cavernous. Which no is yeah. great, um, given the nature of the game. It, it's shocking how much the Metroid series runs on minimalism. Uh, yeah. when you actually break it down. And I think that this song kind of exemplifies that despite sounding outwardly like there's a lot going on. I I 100% blame Super Metroid, among other things, for my love for ambient music and neo-folk stuff. Because that's sort of the vibe that Super Metroid was going for in, in its soundtrack. Yeah, absolutely. Like, this is, I think, technically a march. I would describe this as technically being a march. But it, well, you'd better, because you picked it. I know, right? <laughs> no. uh, we have a March episode. I brought a waltz. Um, th th this definitely sounds like a, a, a March, but it's sort of a neo-folk March, if yeah. that even exists. It's, it's definitely an interesting blending of genres in a way that I really like. And it's, yeah, and it's very tense, and it sounds very strong. Wrong, which is very fitting for the boss that you are about to face, mm -hmm. especially if you're playing a ROM hack. <laughs> I feel like a lot of Super Metroid themes uh, play on mystery and uh, almost horror themes, but this one is much more like you know where the monster is, the monster know where you are, it's time to get down. It's got a build up to it. Yeah. I find it kind of funny that you mention uh, Metroid sometimes touching on horror themes. Uh, here's another random YouTube shout out. The, uh, I believe it's the channel um, Video Game Animation Study. He has done a series of videos on Metroid games. And yeah. pretty much he talks about how uh, different types of horror are there for pretty much every game up to uh, every 2D game at least up to Metroid Fusion where he mentioned, uh, uh, he has videos explaining how how they create a sense of dread and and fear uh -huh, in uh -huh. the player yeah. which uh funny how that turned out yeah i, I should note he, he did make those videos before Metroid Dread was even announced so of kind of funny how things turn out but uh, but yeah, I, I definitely agree with the the vibe of uh, horror elements. This is yeah, uh, and this one kind of goes past that. Yeah, uh, I, like I, I can in a way I can also kind of see say Michael Myers marching to get you yeah. to this song. Like, yeah, exactly. There yeah. is that uh, the horror vibe to it as well. Like just the fact that it's not a clean march but like a thumping like it uh, still echoes a little bit to that sense that there was a, a sense of suspense that has built up uh, but that it's about to go down I think it's also at least in my mind interesting that this uh, out of all the songs in this episode, this is the second fastest one. Uh, by my count, it was at 133 BPM, which kind of, to contrast with the others, most of the, the other songs we have here are like, the army is getting ready to fight, or 
the army is just showing off or something like that. This is like, no, someone is marching to kill someone else. Yeah. Yeah. This one's got a this one's got a very like directive energy to it that I think I've almost never heard that since. Like this this song is almost lightning in a bottle the way it's well, the way it's composed. And I know I've already said that phrasing about Bravely Default earlier, but it's true twice, and I kinda hate that it's true twice. <laughs> Cause this is another well, of these things that fair. people try to replicate and have never succeeded. Yeah. And it's certainly nothing like any other song in the entire Metroid franchise. No. I Which makes it, it all the more precious. Oh. It definitely also works to uh, enhance the, the feeling of uh, well, dread that a, a player who had played the first Metroid and was getting into Super Metroid would probably have. Because They've already met Ridley in the intro, so they know he's alive again. Mm -hmm. By the time you get to this place, if you're doing the regular playthrough without uh, using tricks to sequence break, you, have, you would already have met um, Kraid and would have seen that uh, the Super Metroid version of Kraid is a bit bigger than the original Metroid version Just of Kraid. And you also will have passed the... The entrance to North, the North, the part of North Fair that is Ridley's lair, which has Ridley's face on it mm -hmm. as a sculpture. So, chances are, if you are a Metroid One veteran and you are hearing this, you are going, "Well, crap! I don't want to see how they changed that boss fight." It's a very distinctive face. Oh yeah. You know, before we move on, yeah, I, I just want to comment that a lot of our picks harken back to our intro episode for some inexplicable reason. It's kind yeah. of funny how nostalgic this episode is starting to feel. And yet time marches on. I was holding back to not make that joke during the Chrono Trigger segment. Ah. <sighs> Well, let's march to a beat of a different drummer. How about some Heroes of the Might and Magic 3? Yes. So, I picked this song because I thought it was funny. I was about to because... say, this doesn't sound very March-esque. I, I listened to it a couple times and I'm like, try to figure out what the point of this one was. Well, that's because it's a March song. Oh, God. Marsh instead of boo. Yeah, uh, for those <laughs> for those listening, uh, that's Marsh with an S. Yeah, he's, he's saying. Um, yeah. Yes, that was the reason. In fact, you know the, um, the, the funny thing is that my first note on this song is that the way I I can see this as a march. Is if it's mimicking slow and deliberate steps in uh, rough terrain, which it does for the record. Like I looked into it purely because of the pun. I kept it because after the little uh, the little introduction, it goes militaristic. Yeah. Not much, like, but definitely militaristic. Like, this is the... Uh, all of the sub-faction of l weird little swamp freaks that comprise the fortress town uh, that uh, are going to uh, strike and ambush and break down the armies that are invading on the ground and uh, kind of become this unseen slow rumbling of a force that rises from beneath the, the surface, the murky, murky surface of that marsh, but uh, that uh, build up to something powerful, which is uh, interesting for this one, uh, not just because it's an early game faction or a fortress faction, but also because of Again, the kind of sneakier tactics that uh, some of those uh, units that uh, comprise 
this faction uh, specialized in. There's a lot of flyers and there's a lot of status effects. There's the the, the bulls whose name I can't quite remember that can paralyze enemies and the likes. It's very status effect oriented, very dirty fighting, you know. And it's funny you say that because my second note on this song was that it sounds more sneaky than March Light. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, my primary note, I'm just going to go ahead and read what I said here. Not that By I want to complain because this doesn't sound like a march. Uh, but it is a very, very, very cinematic song is one thing I got from it. Like this definitely feels yes. like it could be a moving a movie score over a montage. Yeah. yeah, especially I... given that it starts in a place and ends in a very different place, so there's definitely this kind of feel that could correspond to specific events of a scene, even though it's in-game uh, tone theme that loops. Right. Yeah, like, uh, to the point of it being cinematic, like, I easily can imagine one of those uh, anime scenes where they kind of play the sneaky bits for laughs a little bit. So the guy's sneaking through the base, almost getting caught, and you're supposed to chuckle at that. But then suddenly he actually gets into the fortress at the end, and then there's all those strings in the song. Yeah, because the start does uh, some instruments that are associated with that kind of goofy, sneaky situation, like the wood, I'm not sure if it's a nobo or clarinet or something like that. But uh, there's these kind of tones that can be a bit uh, goofy, but it's a setup for a payoff, and that payoff is all that powerful swell that comes after that. But isn't nearly orderly enough to count as a march. No. But it counts as a march. It, it possibly does count as a march. I did not examine that song under that context, and. Maybe I yeah. maybe I should. And, and if it's another type of wetland like a fen, I apologize in advance. With that covered, let's move on to some Yakuza Zero. Before Galen begins talking about his pick, I'll just I I'll, I'll just repeat my first note for this song. How is this a march? Well, allow me to explain. Mostly by talking Please about do. what we alluded to at the beginning, what a march is. And actually, before I want to do that, I want to actually say that Ranikel completely unintentionally inspired this talking point. Excellent. From a completely... I love when I do things on accident. It's very low effort. It is. Um, <laughs> anyway. So I will explain as we go on what that talking point is. But first, let's talk about what a march is. It is a piece into two time meant to march to. I know that Eddie said it can be in 4-4, four, four, but that's more perception than anything else, because everyone kind of thinks of music in 4-4 four, four terms. But yeah. from a strict music theory standpoint, from a fundamentalist music theory standpoint, a march must be in 2-2. Two, two, which is what this point is about fundamentalism no. now one of the songs I brought up that is not in a video game to my knowledge though some of the composers have done some game work in the past is The Divine Conspiracy by Epica I would just sigh a little bit in the corner go for it I was not doing that for your like March of Mephisto was almost my choice but then I stopped myself going this is too close to the mark but I need to talk about this. <laughs> no, um, I get you. But the joke was there. It was. Uh, this particular song is written in 4-4. Four, 4-4 four. Four, four is four quarter notes to one measure. But what happens if you combine those two quarter notes together into a single note? Well, that becomes a half note. You have two half notes to a measure. That's still 4-4 four, four time. But that's also 2-2 two, two time, isn't it? That would be correct if my remains from uh, when I took uh, music uh, classes uh, still correct, yes? Right. 
So, the point of that is, 2-2 two, two is notationally no different than 4-4. Four, four. They are the same. Of course, yeah. you will be told by music theory people that they are not the same, but that is a bold-faced lie. That is just wrong. That is incorrect. 2-2 two, two and 4-4 four, four are identical. They are just, it's just math. At least that would be uh, incorrect or correct depending on how traditionally you view that thing. Exactly. Rand is starting to get You're to welcome. my point. So take the guitar riff from The Divine Conspiracy. One, two, and three, four. One, two, and three, four. What happens when you break that down into two, two? One and a two and one and a two. Hmm, that beat is starting to sound familiar, isn't it? Sure does. So in the case of the Divine Conspiracy, I could break down all of that and take a look at the... If you write that song as 2-2, two, two, I can prove very quickly and easily that it counts by the strict technical definition of a march. Gentlemen, does this song sound like a march to you? Sure doesn't. Nope. There's my point. I brought up the Divine Conspiracy in the same way Schrodinger's cat was originally brought up. Taking a theory yes. to its logical extreme, using a deliberately bad example that is actually correct, to show that the rules are stupid. That they are. Yep. Normally when I say you gotta know when to break the rules, it's because I'm trying to expand horizons. I'm trying to show that uh, there's something that's exemplary here. In this particular instance, I'm using this song as an example that the rules don't actually work but they are enforced by fundamentalists, specifically in this case music notation fundamentalists, in a way that stifles creativity. And the conversation that brought this up was actually from Infinite Wealth, the dub, talking about how a character came in, and I mentioned this woman's role in Tales of Shilia, and how the de was just set way too high on her at that point in time. Mm -hmm. And it made her sound like she had a lisp. And that led to a discussion in the Discord about what a DSer is, what its functions are, and that, in my opinion, you should just not buy one of these because they're expensive and pointless, because you could just EQ to get the same result a lot easier and a lot cheaper. Maybe not a lot easier, but definitely a lot cheaper. And certainly a lot easier yeah. in terms of real time, because DSer is just software. As long as you've got control over the parameters, you can make it work. Exactly. It's not even hard to do so. And the thing that I mentioned about actual physical DSers and what they mean now is back like 20 years ago before Pro Tools and its plugins got as powerful as they are, um, these sorts of devices were needed, but now in the modern day, they are absolutely not needed. But music fundamentalists, music recording fundamentalists will tell you you're wrong for that line of thinking, that you have yeah, to use analog gear, you must blah, 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 because blah, blah. Because it was, because it was on their shopping list when they, uh, set up of uh, equipment so they assume it's still the case right but more importantly enforce that it's still the case by telling you you're wrong yeah. for trying to do something different this is so pervasive that i have gear in my gear rack right now that i literally never use that's just there for show i have spent money I on see. crap to put in my gear rack to look like it's a more full rack than it is ah. so this sort of fundamentalism is bullshit and that applies to marches, too. This yeah. stifles creativity. As long as you get to your destination, you don't need to do that in lockstep. Exactly. Funny lockstep march, ha 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 ha. Yeah, that, that was very deliberate. Like, Good. The, if you are working as a, as a block, it's not to get there more efficiently. It's to show off, in a way. Exactly. That's what a march is. Exactly. So, yeah, this in the end is actually the crux of my point, is that we've been kind of steadfastly 
following the rules of marching with a little bit of deviation because marches are a specific way that's a specific thing that's written in a specific style and a specific notation. To which I respond, what happens if I just take the controls off? What if I break a march down to its fundamental basic points, but ignoring the hard and fast rules that are enforced for no reason and make notation difficult? A march gets mm -hmm. you moving in a certain rhythm and pumps you up for what should be war, pumps you up for battle. And going back to an extreme example of this from Yakuza 0 is Gorobajima's war with the Dojima clan at the very end of his side of the game. And that entire dungeon sequence. Which is all the more funny when you know Majima and see him as the single least likely person to march in a very controlled manner. That's literally the antithesis of what he is, especially at this point. Exactly. But when you think about the other half of a march getting you pumped up, all I can think of is a show I bring up a lot, weirdly, on this show, and that's The Wire, and Omar Little going to rob a corner and whistling the farmer of the Dell as he does. And that's how I see this particular song, Rain, which is the main theme of Yakuza 0, as well as Goro Majima's final dungeon theme, which, again, kind of goes into my point that Yakuza 0 was more about Majima than it ever was about Kiryu. Um, even with Kuze being the probably the most iconic character from that game. Indeed. Um, that sort of powering up and going into it on a rhythm, I immediately just shock over to Rain because of its, because of its power, because of what it's capable of doing. And I think exploring a song like this is important, given its actual nature and again that marches as a fundamentalist notation are stupid yeah uh but I, I suppose like if i were to play a little bit of devil's advocate uh, it would be just to say those quote-unquote rules exist but their usefulness nowadays is more like as a guideline to the composer so that they can think in different ways because a composer composing for a for a four song might think differently than if they were composing for a two two song, for example. Right, which technically is the same thing. But uh, a guideline that helps you think differently is very different from a hard rule. Right. It's important to know the rule so you so you know when you break it and why you break it. Right. Um, yeah, I, I, I know usually when we bring up songs like this that seem so far off base, it's a joke. I really kind of wanted to... Couldn't be me. Right? <laughs> um, I wonder where I've heard that before. <laughs> uh, you brought up this topic and you bring up the bigger subversion than I did. My whole <laughs> argument is this is not a subversion, just a different take on the concept. <laughs> Yeah, and on the on the next episode, we're talk we will be talking about waltzes that are not in three four or something. I mean that that is also like I would have one I would have picked an epica song again just to just to prove that point as well. But waltzes are also like waltzes because of the same kind of fundamentalist notation problems have made it so anything that wants to be three four has to call itself six eight. You know, the funny thing is, I probably would have brought a, a Metroid song, Crates of from the original Metroid, which is in 6-8. Yeah, exactly. And it does feel like a waltz. Uh-huh. And the same exact rules, the, the same exact argument applies. Rules are great when they're not used as a bludgeon. If they're used to help yeah. you get your thoughts together and make something cool, awesome. If they're used to bludgeon a composer into being, well, you didn't make this, so you're wrong. That's crap. I don't like that. Honestly, while we're on this diatribe and on the off-topic mention of Craig's Lair, I feel like it's worth bringing up a personal uh, story this time. Usually it's Galen's story time, but now it's, it's Eddie's story time. Go for it. Uh, Take us away. So uh, I have taken piano lessons, but only for three years for financial reasons way right. before the, mm -hmm. uh, the pandemic. Um, but one of the things I wanted was, like, I didn't care about performing public. 
I am autistic, I don't like being in front of everyone. I didn't care about being in a band, same reason. I just wanted to know how to play some cool songs. And of course, most of the songs that came to my mind were either songs from the Fullmetal Alchemist anime, because I grew up with it, or video game songs. Right. And one day I brought uh, Kraid's Lair from the first Metroid as a song that I wanted to learn. Yeah. And my teacher was uh, classically uh, trained as a pianist. She has like a, a lot of diplomas and whatnot. She, she right. has some pedigree. And she was surprised that the song was 6-8 but sounded remarkably like a waltz. It sounded like 3-4. Because waltzes for fundamentalists are always 3-4. Mm -hmm. And she loved it. Because like she's classically trained but she loves when people do things differently in music. She's not a stickler for the rules. Oh, you had the cool teacher. I remember when I brought my Final Fantasy VI book to my piano teacher, she called it not real music. Oh. <laughs> I, I brought, like, songs from the two different Fumero Alchemist anime uh, shows. The original and FMA Brotherhood. And she was like, oh my god, I love how these two completely separate series, but from the same franchise, happen to have amazing songs together. They all sound so incredible. I like your teacher. It, She's really cool. She still teaches. I just don't take lessons anymore. Nowadays, it's mostly because of time and health reasons. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, she's really cool. But that, that goes to show, like, she spent basically her entire life uh, teaching classical piano and being taught classical piano. And then this nerd shows up with game music, and she's like, oh my god, they do things so differently. I had no idea. Yeah, and again, that's kind of part of the problem with classical training, is that it, it instills these hard and fast rules into someone's mind. Your your teacher had a very open mind, which is great. I wish more people did. Yeah. Like, you have those rules that you learn, and uh, you get certified for being great at knowing those rules. Great. Now what do you do with those? Do you follow them to the letter and regurgitate them? Or do you consider them for what they are and their concept, and uh, accept to build up on that. Yeah, I, as a, as a final point on this topic, I, I always like to remember the, the usual joke from literature, where uh, people are, the teachers are, are taught in, at university to uh, teach to their students uh, how to interpret uh, works of art, works of literature, mm -hmm. in one specific way. But sometimes the curtain is just blue. There's nothing more to it. Uh-huh. Indeed. Those rules are, aren't always applicable. Right. So, yeah, that was my, that was my little TED talk about this. Um, as for Rain, the song itself, I mean, it's just a great song. It's just a great, like, techno rock song. Nothing wrong with it. It's got a great energy. I'll just, I'll just quote one of my notes. It must be one hell of an experience to beat up Mook to this song. It's great. It is. It's great. Yakuza 0 has a great soundtrack, and that one's, weirdly enough, for a soundtrack I already called great, it's actually, its star has kind of risen for me as I play through the Year of the Dragon. I, I really kind of go back to Zero a lot, not just the one song. Um, and this one, this one also really grew on me. Um, yeah. So, yeah. It just feels like it's... It's a, it's a payoff. It is. It really is. Like, you've been through uh, all of those s games and scheming and manipulations and cross and, and uh, all treachery and all that, and but you and you can outsmart most of the people involved, but you can't outsmart a kick in the face. Mm hmm. Um. So yeah, um, it, it it isn't quite a march by the terms of the uh, by the terms of the hard and fast rules, but again, it all comes back down to my key phrase: you gotta know when to break the rules. I think this hits the fundamentals. Um, I think it can be interpreted that way, and uh, again, it just it's just a great song. It just sounds good, and yeah, as Eddie said, it's a lot of fun beating up mooks to it. So, <sighs> great fun. Also, that chorus is just fun. That chorus is great. 
I actually really like the use of vocals clean and processed across this song. Oh, yeah. It's mixed really well. Like, just from a strictly technical level, I, I like how it sounds. And, uh... May as well just go ahead and dive in now. Let's talk about the other stuff we're playing that aren't necessarily marches, except one that probably is. Music Arcade, now playing. <laughs> Yes, it turns out when you're playing a tactical game uh, about uh, armies clashing with each other, you're probably gonna get some marches in. <laughs> Who but, would have uh, thought? Uni yeah, Unicorn Overlord, the latest Vanilla Wear game released recently, and uh, I've been playing it a lot because I absolutely love it. Like. I had decent expectations, and even just playing the demo before its release, it shattered them. Like, it's as pretty as I expected, of course, but it's also probably the the most fun take on the on the not the tactics ogre, but the ogre battle version of a strategy game. And I'm including the original Ogre Battles on that. Huh. I think it beat them. That's high I, I praise. Wanna, Too bad it'll I, I never come out on know. PC. Yeah, that, that's a shame. It sounds great, but uh, uh, not to uh, throw you under the bus or anything, but I do want to note something that made me laugh, which is mm -hmm. uh, we were never late for an episode because someone w was uh, busy playing video games. Like, we know when to stop playing and come to the podcast. This got closed when Rana showed up at 1 a.m. my time going, oh, sorry, I forgot about my songs because I was playing Unicorn Overlord. This got pretty close, yeah. I may have been playing some of the main minigame in that game uh, during the free show. Oh, God. You really um, got to, huh? It's very good. It's got systems that work, but I introduced progressively enough that its complexity get you eventually like yesterday i played this game by spending five uninterrupted hours not getting into a single battle but just rearranging my troops and my troops equipment so that synergies kind of work in a way that felt less like strategizing and more like programming i just love that it's probably never coming to to, uh, Windows PCs because it sounds fun. No, uh, the the development team, Vanillaware? Question mark. Yeah, like to, uh, I'll summarize it uh, in a way that feels pretty all encompassing. This game feels like a late PS2 games in many ways. It runs as good as a PS2 game should run on more modern hardware. That is to say, it runs at a good frame rate at any time, even on Switch. It has a charm to it in the color scheme, in the art style, that uh, uh, has been present and in a very similar way ever since Odin Sphere. It has a scenario that's extremely basic like that. And uh, it has the sensibilities of not making a uh, PC port for a game that's otherwise multi-platform. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and say this. This last week, uh, Nintendo basically bludgeoned an emulator out of existence um, under severe legal yep. threat. Uh, I believe it was called Yuzu. The correct. Switch emulator. Yep. Um... I am exceedingly opposed to this sort of litigiousness. I find Agreed. it to be anti-archival, something that Nintendo has flat out said they are against archiving. Like, they've outright said yes. they're not okay. And I'm like... And they are unamb unambiguously in the wrong. Correct. So what I think I might end up doing is finding a mirror of Yuzu, because it's on the internet somewhere. I can find that. No, of course. The tapes are circulating. Uh-huh. I'm gonna find that. I'm going to buy Unicorn Overlord on, like, PlayStation or something, never play it there, and just run the Switch emulator out of sheer spite to Nintendo. Honestly, fair. Because I'm, I'm not okay with what just happened, and all sorts of other 
emulators and similar products um, falling off the wayside. Yeah, talking about companies stuck in the past. Yeah. Nintendo is emerging as one of the bigger villains in gaming, and they've been heading in this direction fairly steadily for the last 10 years or so. They've been coasting for on uh, the goodwill of the internally developed franchise for too long? Far too long. Yeah. I, it, I think it, it kind of... Uh, their journey, their uh, villain origin story kind of yeah. started when they came off as being completely against uh, fan games and mods. Uh-huh. Which already was an awful take, but you could go, okay... It could maybe damage your properties, your IPs, all right. But yes. Then they came up against uh, be, as being against speedruns, as being against playing differently from how they want, yes. against uh, emulators, and like they're against. They were for up. a long time against Smash tournaments in general because they didn't want Smash to be seen as a competitive game. They're that petty. Yes. No, then. Uh... They are terrible, and I would love to uh, delve deeper into that. Yeah. But I love Unicorn of a lot enough that I want to cut that conversation off because I'd rather sing the praises of that game. By all it means, is that do. good. I would love to learn how it plays. I would love to enjoy the game. I'm just going to do everything I can not to give Nintendo money to do it. Please continue. Yeah, by all means. And uh, so yeah, as far as the music goes, this one, it feels very, very tactics game, as it should be. It's, uh, uh, it ends up being a bit old uh, eventually, but that may have been because I cleared as many nodes of uh, encounters as I could in the in the first region. The game map is divided in five main regions, and each has uh, its uh, own set of themes uh, for uh, day and night, uh, overworld travel, normal battles, etc., etc. Right. And uh, I've just now started getting on my second region with uh, a welcoming committee that had me uh, fend off. Uh, uh, I calculated that I had to destroy uh, a group of enemies every 2.7 seconds on average. Wow. Expert mode is not messing around. Sounds that way. I was yeah. going to say... Sounds serious. Vanillaware is usually is. very, very good at their artistry and their creatives. Uh, I've been a little more mixed yes. on their gameplay as a whole, but I'm definitely interested in this I one. I was as well. Like, for all the uh, cool charm and how much of a love letter to uh, uh, classic D&D inspired games like Golden Axe in particular, uh, Dragon's Crown was a rough game, especially playing on your own. Yeah, it's uh, it's very much all the jank of Golden yeah. Axe. Yeah. Unicorn of a Lord is an excellent video game. And it should say something that this is not the only game I have on my no playing list because Balatro also came around. It sure did. That that's an overlap we have. Balatro is more addictive than you think it is, and you already think it's pretty addictive. Yeah. Turns out, building up poker hands can be very fun when you start going in two crazy ways way beyond the rules. Mm -hmm. Again, the fun when they've broken those little things. Like, the last run I did had uh, a, a card that uh, increased your points modifier whenever you added a card in your deck, a relatively rare event normally, but I also had another joker that adds one card every single uh, match, essentially. So that took me all the way to uh, a round where I had to score 300 million points. Uh, to give you an idea, I had to score 300,000 to uh, have it count as a cleared run. Huh. The 
these decks go absolutely crazy and uh, it's super fun that way. And the uh, atmosphere, both visual and uh, with uh, the soundscapes and the music, it's funny because a lot of games that use uh, traditional playing cards and traditional casino game imagery want uh, oftentimes to uh, take the role of the fancy casino that's all about luxury and the, the big Vegas palace and all that. Balatro feels more in line with the countryside gambling hall where there's uh, very old video poker machines, most of them with nobody uh, in there except maybe w uh, one that's in use with somebody that's never been seen outside of this seat and somebody that's probably passed out drunk or something. It's got that sleazy, partly the effect way around it where anything goes and I love it for that too. Honestly, yeah, that, um, that's a that's a funny description. Uh, my description of it would be like between the spectro cards and the tarot cards. It's like a wizard came to a, a town in the countryside and he's drunk and he's just insisting, "Play, no, no, no! You're gonna play. You're gonna love this game, dude. Play just one yeah. more round, guy." Yeah, and he's making up the rules and really hoping you don't realize he has no idea how to actually play poker. <laughs> I, I will note that it's transparent how different our experiences in this game in this game have been, because uh, I, I also played a lot. Like I have uh, about thirteen hours of playtime in this on on Balatro. Uh, mm -hmm. And to give an idea, I'll just I'll just say what happened in my latest run. I got the uh, red and black deck. I can't remember what it's called, but basically it makes it so every card in your deck is either uh, hearts or uh, spades. There are no clubs or dice. Ah. And I got my, my first and only joker after my first uh, round win was the one that adds multiplier when you when your plate hand has at least one card of every one of the four uh, the four suits. Ah, what suits. suits? Yeah, that's it. Sorry, I had the Portuguese word in my mind. I see. But yeah, I had uh, I had a deck. Of only two suits, and I got the the only Joker I could choose from was the one that uh, multiplies my points if I have all four nice. in my play my played hand. Excellent. Um, yeah, the, the, I have the, thanks not... game. Thanks game. I have not played the game yet. I have watched a couple videos on it. it looks very cool. Um, but I did listen to the song that Rana picked. Yeah. Very rarely do I find a song that angers and repulses me in a way that I have this much trouble articulating. I just hate this song, and I don't know why. Huh. It's funny Fascinating. That, funny that you say it's the song that Rana picked, because I'm pretty sure it's the one song in the game. It just it changes yeah, tempo like the, and, uh, and gets like... There's not a lot of songs, but uh, it has a, the... It's a very long song, and it's... It never... You're never really sure why you are in the song. It's very disorienting in this way. I, again, kind of playing off the fact that the imagery that uh, this is uh, uh, 9 a.m., a place where no gambling hall should ever be open, and yet here you are playing another hand. Yeah, the, the song changes tempo and pitch a lot, uh, mm -hmm. depending on what you're doing. So that makes it feel a bit more varied than it really is. But I believe it's We've just... mentioned Breaking the Rule, that song has none. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I I this one just makes my skin crawl. I wish I I wish I could articulate why. Hmm. I, I don't quite get that reaction, but it's not really a pleasant song for me in particular. Uh I play Bellator with YouTube on, on the background to be honest. Honestly, I think that an I'm not saying that specifically for you, but it's kind of fitting that it gets to you in a way you can't even articulate because that song feels like a headache. This is the perfect ga kind of game to put whatever music you want anyway. Yeah. It's just that this one uh, that comes with the game has this feeling of getting way too deep in your own head and suddenly whatever in its life anymore. Yeah... It definitely gets that right. 
Well, on that, Eddie, what have you been playing? Well, speaking of things that get in your in your head, uh, I've been playing Baldur's Gate 3, where you have to deal with uh, a Mind Flayer Parasite in your head. Yay! Yeah. Uh, I, I'm happy to report that I appear to be at least partially free from my sickness of I just want to create more characters. I am actually progressing the story now. Congratulations! Hey, did you know Dragon's Dogma 2 released like two days ago? Just a character creator? Oh. Oh, God. I guess it's a good thing I didn't get into the first Dragon's Dogma, otherwise I probably would be playing the character creator for the second one right now. Play <laughs> but, it uh, anyway! Uh, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, uh, I don't really have much more to say about the soundtrack for Baldur's Gate 3, because if I do, we will run out of songs that I can bring in the podcast. So, <laughs> it is a cool soundtrack, I assure you. Uh, I've also been playing a little bit of Last Epoch, since version 1.0 came out. Uh, I'm happy to inform Rana that I did manage to make my Bleed Rogue Falconer build work. But, uh, Congratulations! Does it have the same problem as me where you die in one hit and if you don't, you instantly heal it back? Two hits, but uh, yeah. <laughs> nice. Also, damage over time is a bit weak in the game, so I'm pretty sure I'm just gonna abandon that, that build once I have to fight uh, Lagon the second time, the big yeah. Thulu like dude. Because you have to fight yeah. him in the Monolith of Fate, which is the main endgame system. And uh, I'm sure I'm gonna die a lot there. Oh yeah. Uh, I certainly did. For the first fight. I, I did as well. You have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Um, and then, of course, Last Epoch 1.0 came out. Bellatro came out recently. Baldur's Gate 3 recently had a patch. So, of course, my fourth game is another game that got a recent up. No, it's uh, Dead Cells. <laughs> yep. Oh, I that. never finished the Castlevania DLC, so I am trying to do that now. Uh, I can't How's be... that working out for you? I've reached Dracula twice. I didn't even get to his second phase once. Though, admittedly, well, then. you guys know me. Of course, you know that I made a, an instant beeline for the costumes. Cool. I already have uh, Trevor, Alucard, Death, uh, Maria, and Simon unlocked. I'm glad Going Maria got them. counted. I, I, was warning, I was wondering if they were going to cut her out. They have Shanoa. That DLC is such a love letter, it's crazy. Oh yeah, like, it, even Shanoa is in the game. She's not, uh, you don't get her costume, but she's the vendor, uh, one of the vendors for the Castlevania stages. Along oh, that's with cool. the librarian. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's really cool. Like, they, they, they kind of show they have more love for the franchise than Konami themselves have. 100%. Shocking. I'm shocked. Uh, another fun thing and, is uh, that uh, if you reach Dracula with a, a costume from this DLC, you have a unique uh, set of lines depending on the costume. Oh. Yes. So uh, if you reach him as uh, as a Belmont, he'll talk about uh, uh, another Belmont showing up, and if you die, he'll say he'll wait for your uh, descendant. Uh, if you go as Death, he'll talk about how his lieutenant is betraying him. It, it it's a huge fun love time. letter. It's really fun. Yeah. Uh, but I you want to know something fun, Eddie? Uh, go on. Check it as first phase. That's the easy one. Oh, I know. Like, I I've played this game enough to know that, to, to fully expect I can that. consistently reach the second phase. I haven't beaten it. One time. Or maybe once. Maybe once. It's been a while. Anyway. Yeah, uh, when I mentioned earlier in the episode how about how uh, I love some games that I am god-awful at, that, that this is what I was referring to. I, I suck at that stuff, but I love it. But yeah, Generally a good sign if you can love something you're bad at. Mm -hmm. You are correct. But uh, uh, as for things I've been playing, that's basically it. I 
spent a, a week and a half with COVID. So that was a slow week. That was when I uh, got all those hours in Bellatro because nothing else would be playable with my headaches that week. I don't know what's wrong with me, but I definitely can sympathize with not wanting to play complicated games because, ow. <laughs> yeah. So what have you been playing then? Well, uh, more Infinite Wealth, which is a game I'm souring on more and more as I play it. Mm -hmm. uh, then I played some Arcanites, which is a game I played for four years straight now and still adore. Uh, yeah. Two things of note, we got IS4 now, our fourth integrated strategies roguelike mode. Um, yeah. I like this one better than IS3 already. Uh, and Music on it's pretty cool. It's about the uh, Scandinavian equivalent in that universe. And then we had yeah. a rerun of Dorothy's Vision. Verse names like... Sorry, this name's like Yuklumalkar. Yeah. Um, that's how you pronounce that? I guess? I don't know. I'm, I'm not uh, Scandinavian. That's fair. Uh, you are a lot closer to there than I am, that's for sure, though. True. Um, True. But yeah. Um, so yeah, dealing, dealing with the frozen tundra is a lot better than dealing with the seaboard and the dice RNG, which is easily the worst part of IS-3. They cut that out, thankfully. Love a little bit of uh, improvement. Yep. In reruns. Um, and then they also, uh, and then the other thing was a rerun of Dorothy's Vision, um, which is a prelude to my favorite event in Arknight's history, which is Lone Trail. Um, Dorothy's Vision laid a lot of the groundwork for that event, uh, introducing characters, concepts, and uh, basically it was a whole lot of, a uh, whole lot of, um, not foreshadowing, that's the wrong word. Whole lot of um, exposition. Needed exposition nah. for what Lone Trail would be. So, looking back on it and playing it again, having played Lone Trail, it gave me a better appreciation for this particular event. Not so much the boss. Boss is still pathetically easy, but that's, you know, you can't win them all. Love to have a little bit of, in of hindsight. Yep. And finally, I also got on the Deep Rock Galactic Survivor train, which seems to Ooh. just be using music from Deep Rock Galactic. As far as YouTube will tell me, I can't really tell myself. And same for me, I haven't played Deep Rock Galactic, only Survival. Right. So, um, the game's fun. It's not my favorite Survivor life, yeah. but it's a fun distraction. It's a different take on the genre, and I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, me too. That it focuses a lot more on you chasing the goodies rather than uh, staying around in place. Yeah. Curious to see where they take it because it it's it's got interesting bases uh, and uh, content uh, would be nice then. Yeah, I would I would definitely love to hear more from DRG Survivor. A little more, a little more bang for a buck. Yeah. And that and is it for me. if they can add uh, a couple of fun space woven songs, even better. And with that, that is all the time we have for this episode. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Sorry I was a little out of it today. I'm a bit sick. As always, you can find a playlist of songs we talked about and our contact in the description below. Please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, with that, I guess it's time to march on off to another episode. Have a good one, y'all. See you next time for a very normal episode. See you. Foreshadowing.